Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you very much tonight for the privilege of giving us once again that we'll come and study your word together. And we thank you for your children, for the love and interest you have put in our hearts that we always come to study your word. We're praying that our coming together today will not be in vain in Jesus' name. We pray that you enrich our lives with your word. Bless the young and bless the old. Bless the newcomers too. And give us understanding in your word. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. I welcome every one of you once again to our Bible study tonight. Always a joy and pleasure as we take our turn week after week to study the word of God. Presently, we're in the first epistle, General of Peter. And we're still in chapter 1, we're in the fifth study today. We're looking at chapter 1, verses 17 through to 21. The great inestimable price of our redemption. You will notice that uh, Peter had been talking about the Lord. And has been talking about the salvation and the redemption that we have in him. In the last study I read to you and we studied together. What happens to us when the blood of Jesus actually washes and cleanses us? And it is what he continues with today. But as a background to the verses we're looking at, please turn to chapter 1 from verse 14. As obedient children, I told you last week in the original it means as children of obedience. Not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. In these immediate uh, previous verses, previous to the verses we are looking at today. Peter reminded the people and is reminding us of a higher calling. That is a calling to a holiness of life or the life of holiness. A preacher of the past uh, century said Spurgeon, he said, the church of God must be holy. Then he gave the reason why he said, because it's founded uh, by holy God upon holy principles and for holy purposes. Continuing, he said, the church has been redeemed by a holy savior with a holy sacrifice and dedicated to holy service. Her great glory is the Holy Spirit whose influences and operations are all holy. Her law book is the Holy Bible. Her armory is the Holy Covenant. Her comfort is the Holy Prayer. Her convocations are holy assemblies. Her citizens are holy men and women. She exists for holy purposes and ends and follows after holy examples. You'll understand from this quotation from Spurgeon that he really believes that we should be holy. And this is what Peter the Apostle is telling us. Because God who has called us and Christ who is the foundation of the church. And because the Holy Spirit himself, they are all holy. Because of that, we are called to holiness. The whole purpose for which God has called us into fellowship with him is that he might display his holiness through us and be examples of holiness in a dirty world. With that background, you want to look at the verses we're looking at today from verse 17. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. Then he tells us about the background of Christ coming to this world in verse 20 who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Those are the verses we're looking at today. Peter, inspired by the Spirit of God, continues in our present study and text today, instructing us that we shall consider the great price of our redemption which is also the means of our holiness. Where Sir Jonas is said, we're strangers and pilgrims, he emphasizes, and, is, and we are watching, he is reminding us, that while we are walking through this wilderness of a world, we should be conscious of the Heavenly Father, 
who is watching all our steps, all our actions, all our thoughts, and all our lives. Because his judgment is pictured as, on the one hand, immediate and impartial. On the other hand, future and fear. Always holding then to the purpose and price of our redemption in our minds will make us to uphold the priority of holiness in our lives. And with the power of Christ, resurrection working in our hearts, then there is the possibility of having a pure heart and living a holy life consistently. We're going to divide our study to three parts. Number one, pilgrims living in godly reverence. Pilgrims living in godly reverence. Number two, the prize of our great redemption. The prize of our great redemption. Then number three, the power of his glorious resurrection. Let's come to number one. Pilgrims, that is Christians, so on a journey. We're strangers in this world. This world is not our home. We're journeying home. And while we're journeying home, we ought to live godly lives. And we live in godly reverence in the fear of God. Look at verse 17. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons, judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. It's talking to believers. And it's saying we are believers who are calling on the Father. We know him as Father because the blood of the Lamb has washed us. The blood of the Lamb has cleansed us. We have been transformed and recreated and changed. We are no more children of the devil, children of darkness, children of this world. We now belong to the Heavenly Father. And it says, you call on the Heavenly Father. You understand he's without respect of persons. And you know he judges every man's action, every man's words. In, if you have that knowledge, then live your life and pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. We're going to break uh, that verse into pieces. And we're going to look at the component parts of that verse. Number one, it says, are you not calling on the Heavenly Father? And if you are calling on him, there is one thing for you to understand. You are sojourning here. You are a pilgrim here. You are a sojourner, a stranger here. Let's see what the Bible is saying concerning the very fact that we children of God, this place is not our home. We're sojourning. We're pilgrims. We're strangers. And life is short. We're looking at First Chronicles chapter 29. Life here is short, but our walk, that is the direction in which we're moving, and then the work we're doing, that means our activity in this short life will determine our eternal destiny and the condition we shall be in hereafter. That is the reason why the condition of life, of our own life, the direction in which we're walking, the conduct and the character we manifest in this world is so very important. And that's why the apostle is telling us, pass your time here, live your time here in the fear of God. In First Chronicles chapter 29, First Chronicles chapter 29, there in verse 15, see what the word of God is saying concerning our sojourning here, for we are strangers before thee, and sojourners as were all our fathers, our days on the earth are as a shadow, and there is none abiding. And uh, that was not the only place where the fact of our pilgrimage, the fact of our sojourning here, the fact that we are strangers here, and we have another home and we are journeying on, that's not the only place it's emphasized. We're told in Hebrews chapter 11, that was the attitude of Abraham. And that was the attitude of many of the patriarchs in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 13. This all died in faith. He's talking about more than one person. And he says, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them. And he confessed, what did he confess? That there were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That is, this earth was not their home. They knew there was a better place. For it says in verse 14, For they that say such things declare plainly, clearly, that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now, they desire a better country. That is an heavenly Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. When God becomes our God, when we become the children of God, we pass the time of life here, our sojourning here, in fear. Because we know that there's another place where we're going to be. And over there in eternity, our eternal destiny, eternal welfare, eternal bliss, eternal happiness, eternal condition will be determined by the life we've lived on earth here in First Peter chapter 2. 
First Peter chapter 2 from verse 11. Dearly beloved, talking to believers, beloved of the Lord. They have realized and they have experienced the love of God. And it now says, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. That's the same emphasis again. That we're not of this world. That we're sojourners here. That we're joining onto a better place. As strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly laws which war against the soul. Having your conversation, that means your conduct, your character, your manner of life, honest among the Gentiles. That whereas they speak against you as evil doers, they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. Let's come back to First Peter chapter 1 verse 17 we have emphasized to underline the fact that we are sojourning here it says if you call on the father now he gives us the characteristic of the father he gives us the attribute of the father who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work he tells us that God is no respecter of persons and is the almighty God, is the omniscient God, is the all-knowing God. He knows everything about us and when he's going to judge, he's going to judge without respect of persons. That means there will be no partiality. His uh, judgment will be fair. His judgment will be according to knowledge and according to the truth. In Romans chapter 2, first of all, look at verse 11. It says, for there is no respect of persons with God. No respect of persons with God. What's Peter telling us? Uh, Peter is telling us that the Father is watching us. He's looking at our actions. He's looking at our motives. He's looking at our character. And he's going to judge without respect of persons. And the same thing Paul is emphasizing here. As he says in verse 11, there is no respect of persons with him. There is a consequence of that. We call it a corollary. That is uh, something that comes out of that verse 11. Look at verse 9 and verse 10. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. It says on the one hand, the people that do evil. On the one hand, the people that are not born again. On the one hand, the people that trespass against the commandments of the Lord. There is judgment. But on the other hand, in verse 10, but glory and honor and peace to every man that walketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. Did you notice something in verse 9? To the Jew first, also to the Gentiles. Do you see that same thing in verse 10? To the Jew first, also to the Gentiles. That means it doesn't really matter, Jew or Gentile. The Lord is watching everyone and is going to judge everyone's action. That's the same thing we're told in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. We're looking first of all at the latter part of verse 25. Colossians chapter 3, latter part of verse 25. There is no respect of persons. Again, it's telling us the attribute and character of God. That when he looks at our work, when he judges us, there is no respect of persons with him. What's the consequence of that? What are we deducing from that? Now verse 24, knowing that of the Lord, ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance for ye serve the Lord Jesus. That's the consequence of the fact that God is no respecter of persons. You are serving God, you are small, you are great, you are a man, you are a woman, you are serving God faithfully. There is no respect of persons with God. The reward he gives to other people, the same reward he's going to give to you. On the other hand, in verse 25, but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he has done. On. And then he concludes by saying, for there is no respect of persons. Those who do well, they'll be rewarded. Those who do evil, they will be chastised. Because uh, God is going to apply the same standard. We're coming back to First Peter again. First Peter chapter 1, verse 17. It says, and if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons, now we understand that, judges according to every man's work, here is what we're not to do. Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. It tells us there is one way to live. We should live in the fear of 
God. Because we know that God is no respecter of persons. That is going to judge with impartiality and justice. Because we know that even though men may praise us and approve of our actions. Because they do not really see beyond the outward external expressions of our action. We need to understand that by him actions are weighed. He knows our motives. He knows our thoughts. He knows our, he knows our passions. He knows our desires. He knows the background of the action that we show forth. Because of that, he says, we should live our life in the fear of God. What we call the fear of God is simply saying we should respect God enough. It's not slavish fear he's talking about. It's not a fear that you have, you tremble every time. It's not a fear you have, you cannot approach God as a loving heavenly father. It's just telling us to respect God, honor God, reverence God because of the fear we have for him. That's a godly fear. Because without that reverence and without that godly fear, we cannot serve God acceptably. Look at what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter chapter 12 hebrews chapter 12 reading there from verse 28 hebrews 12 28 wherefore we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved let us have grace whereby we may serve god acceptably with what with reverence and godly fear then it says for our god is is what is a consuming fire because of the possibility of the judgment to come that's the reason that we're to serve god in fear godly reverence and godly fear the christian he fears to offend god because he loves god so much he knows that god has paid a great price in the death of his only begotten son to give him salvation because of that he wants to honor god he wants to reverence god and he wants to do everything to show that he really respects the name and the commandments of the lord not only that he fears to dishonor the cross of christ he says how can christ die for me so much like that how can he pay such a great price for me like that and then i will dishonor his name he he fears to dishonor the cross of Christ. Not only that, he fears to grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that has come to convict, that has come to convert, that has come to comfort us, that is an abiding friend, that is always leading and directing us in the way. A real Christian appreciating the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he fears to dishonor the Lord and he fears to disobey the Lord. He fears to grieve the Spirit of God. Now when we talk of a fear of God, Many do not understand, especially our young people. Young people listen now. When we talk about the fear of God, what does the fear of God really produce? Let me show you. In a Proverbs chapter 8, we're looking at Proverbs chapter 8. We're following through on the fear of God because it says, We shall pass the time of our sojourning here, pilgrimage here, our journey here from earth to heaven. We shall pass that time in fear. What does that fear do? Proverbs chapter 8 verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the forward mouth do I hate. That's what happened when that, uh, the wife of uh, Potiphar invited Joseph to sin. He said, how can I do this? And sin against my God. That's the fear of God. The fear of God makes us to hate evil, makes us to hate pride arrogancy every kind of evil the evil way and the forward mouth we hate it we run away from it you know why because we honor god we know that if we say something wrong or do something wrong there is a watching eye looking at us and because of the honor and the fear we have for god we dare not do it like joseph in proverbs chapter 16 verse 6 proverbs 16 verse 6 by mercy and truth iniquity is put and by the fear of the lord men depart from evil you want to know the people that fear god reverence god honor god respect god they're the people that flee from evil they flee useful laws all the things that other people are doing he will say no i cannot do that others may i cannot they don't have the fear of god in them therefore they can practice evil i cannot because i know the lord is present with me every time in fact that was the very mind of God. He wanted his fear to be in the heart of all the people that approached him, all the people that came to worship him. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29. 
look at what God wanted and look at his desire for the children of men. He said, oh, that there was such an heart in them that they should fear me and keep all my commandments always that it might be well with them and with their children forever. The Lord looked at the children of Israel and he saw that they were behaving carelessly. They didn't show the fear of God. They didn't run away from evil. And they just uh, did whatever they wanted to do as if there were no law, as if there were no commandments. And then Almighty God said, I'm looking at these people. How I wish they had my fear in them. And then they will keep my commandments always, every time. And then it will be well with them and with their children forever. In Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 40. The people did not have the fear of God in them, so God decided he was going to do something. And this is what he does for new Israel. That is for the church of God. For the people now that are taking the place of Israel. This is the new covenant and this is part of what he does. You come to the Lord. You are born again. You are convicted of your sin. You are converted. The power of God reaches out your life. And there is a mighty change. What do you discover? He puts his fear in your heart. In Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 14. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And I will not turn away from them to do them good. Listen to this. But I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Anybody that backslides, there's no fear of God in him. He knows that God is watching and yet he goes to do the sin that is disrespectful, dishonoring to the Lord. He doesn't have the fear of God. But God says in the new covenant, in which I will make with the people of God. I will put my fear in them, and they shall not depart from me. Oh, I hear somebody saying, Well, that's Old Testament. Old Testament is built on it's built on fear, but the New Testament is built on grace and love, and there is nothing like uh, that kind of fear in the New Testament. You think so? In the New Testament, we are supposed to still reverence God, honor God, respect God, and have the fear of God in our heart. In fact, we were told about the church, uh, the church in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Then at the church's rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and the church was edified, they were edified, and it says, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, they were multiplied. You see the church, those were the people that had grace, those were the people that experienced the love of God, those were the people that were redeemed not by silver, not by gold, but by the blood of the Lamb. And yet it says they were walking, they were living, they were acting, they were behaving, they were conducting their lives in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Ghost and they were multiplied. Second Corinthians chapter 7. In Second Corinthians chapter 7, reading there from verse 1, it says, having therefore these promises dearly beloved, you know if you are dearly beloved of the Lord, if you have tasted of the love of God and the love that is flowing from Calvary, you will not take the love for granted. You know that God loves you so much, you'll be, you will want to reciprocate and pay back a little of that love of God by living a life that is honoring to God. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness. What's the rest of the sentence? In the fear of God. New Testament believers, beloved of God, we are to live in the fear of God. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21. Ephesians 5 verse 21. It says there, submitting yourselves one to another in what? In the fear of God. And now we come back to First Peter chapter 1. We have looked at point 1. And we have looked at this point 1. Telling us, emphasizing that we who are New Testament believers. We are pilgrims. We are sojourners here. And we are living in God godly reverence. Because we live in godly reverence, we will not uh, go into sin. We will not go into evil. We love God so much. We we'll want to honor him and respect him and do what is pleasing in his sight. Actually, it's also because the price of our redemption is so great. And we say, this kind of price had been paid on my redemption. How should I live my life? I should live with so much respect for the one who has paid such a great price for me. That leads us to point number two. The price of our great redemption 
the price of our great redemption. In First Peter chapter 1 verse 18, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Here he tells us that uh, we are not redeemed by anything cheap, anything earthly, anything human, anything that man could evolve or that man could produce. It took something divine, something coming from the very heart of God for us to have redemption. The whole Bible tells us consistently that our redemption is so precious and the price is so great that no man could pay that price himself. And when you know the price of your redemption, you will appreciate your redemption very much in Psalm 49. Psalm 49, verses 7 and 8. It says, None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceases forever. He tells us the redemption is so great, the price is so great, and no man can pay that price himself. When we talk of redemption, redemption actually means that you are purchased. You are bought from the slave market. And uh, that uh, purchase can only be done by a price. It's just like when you go to the market, you want to buy something. You cannot just take it, hold it onto yourself, and then run away. You have to put something down, which is a price that you pay. And our redemption is like that. We could not just be purchased and redeemed from slavery, from the slavery market of sin, or from the slave market of the devil himself. It took the blood of the Lamb, so that we'll be redeemed from the guilt and the condemnation of sin. Not only that, we'll be redeemed from the love and the practice of evil. You see what it does? The redemption was the cleansing of the blood of the lamb our guilt is taken away and whatever we have done the condemnation we felt like a heavy load upon us all that has been taken away that's what we call redemption not only that the practice of sin the practice of evil that had become a habit that you could not shake yourself away from you could not set yourself free from the redemption took care of that and now the practice is cancelled and now you're able to live free even the desire and the love of the evil that uh, in the past well, when you were not born again you will be cruel you will be sinful you will be doing something like this and then you'll be laughing you enjoyed it but now if it happens at all if the devil made you to do anything at all you're very sad you go to the lord you cry you say lord i don't love this i don't want this it should not be in my life and then that redeeming blood atoning blood cleanses you completely and you are totally cleansed and your sins are taken away even the the desire the passion for it and the love for it is taken away not only that you are redeemed from the bondage of sin you know sin has a way of binding us of you just like a cord like a rope and then it ties us and binds us that it becomes very difficult to be free it's like something when they sh when they shaved off his head he became so weak they bound him he, he, he thought he was going to shake himself and get the power he used to have but it was a chain. He couldn't be free and then he put out his eyes. Sin is like that. It binds us with a terrible bondage. But now you are redeemed. You are no longer held in the captivity of sin. Even the affection for it is taken away. In the past, sin mastered you. The fetters of sin fettered your will and bound your will in chains in a habitual chains of sin. Holding you in spite of all the New Year resolutions, in spite of uh, your conscience condemning you. But thank God for redemption. I said thank God for redemption. Redemption through Christ's blood breaks the chain, breaks the fetters. And now you are free in Jesus' name. And so we find the word of God telling us that's exactly what Jesus Christ did in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, reading there in verse 20, tells us it's a great price that Jesus paid for us. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. You have been purchased, you have been redeemed, you are bought with a price. The price of the blood of Jesus. Matthew chapter 26. 
Matthew chapter 26, reading there from verse 28. Here Jesus Christ himself telling us that uh, he was going to pay the price. And what was the price? The blood of the Lamb, his own precious blood. What is? It's my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Shed for many, as many as will believe, as many as will accept. It was done for me. It was done for you. And you take hold of it and say, Lord, cleanse me. I, do, I cannot set myself free from my sin. You are the only one that can do it. Do it for me. The Lord will do it for you. In First Peter chapter 2, First Peter chapter 2, still following through on the redemption and what the blood of Jesus Christ has done for us. First Peter chapter 2 verse 24, it says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. He bore our sins, the guilt of the sin, the load of the sin, the yoke of the sin, everything concerning the sin, the punishment penalty of the sin, the power of the sin. He bore everything for us through his own self, bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should uh, live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. I'm sure you've heard the story of, or the illustration perhaps, of somebody that uh, was carrying a load and then entered into a vehicle. Unfortunately, he was still a cash, he was still carrying the load. And then the driver looked back and said, Mama, what's the matter? Why are you still carrying the load? Oh, he said, my son, you have been so good to carry me. And I thought I should not lay a greater burden on you by putting my load in the vehicle. Oh, he said, Mama, you and your load, the vehicle is supposed to carry every one of you. What an illustration for you and for me. If you have given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, he bore your sins for you. You should not be bearing the shame and the guilt and the condemnation and the power and the penalty of the sin anymore. Christ has borne everything, hand over everything to the Lord Jesus. You'll be totally free in Jesus' name. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, telling us that Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. That's what he did. We were far away from God. We were worse than the prodigal son. But Jesus Christ, he suffered. The just for the unjust. So that from the wilderness of sin where we were, he'll bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened and made alive by the Spirit. And so we understand that Jesus Christ paid the price of our redemption. Uh, if you look at that first Peter chapter 1 verses 18 and 19 again, it tells us for as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things. That is, is not silver, is not gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition uh, from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. It took a sinless one to redeem sinners. That's why there is no sinner like a, like a human being that can save another one, that can redeem another one. And it is the name of Jesus Christ alone that grants us forgiveness and pardon and salvation and redemption. And then we become adopted children of the Almighty God. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, it says, In whom? We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. It tells us here, in whom that is in Christ, we have redemption already. It's yours for the asking. The moment you ask the Lord, the moment you say, yes, I believe Jesus died for me on the cross of Calvary, so that I, who could not save myself, I, who was so weak and powerless, the Lord Jesus Christ can totally save me. The Lord will save you. He will remove all the sins away from you. It says, we have. We have it already. Not that we're going to have it in the future. Redemption through his blood. Then he qualifies it. He calls it the forgiveness of sins. It's because you don't realize that your sins are forgiven. That's why every morning you are still confessing your sins. That's why every Sunday you are still confessing your sins. That's why any little thing that happens to you, say, maybe God is punishing me for the sins I committed before. No. Once your sins are forgiven, it's a sins are forgotten and if anything happens it may be the devil is uh, troubling you you will go to god and claim your authority and victory over the works of the devil you will not be saying maybe it's because of my sin maybe it's what i did before already you are forgiven the sins are taken away according to the riches of his grace and it is a free grace of the lord that's the value of our redemption let me just show you a little uh, insight into the sufferings of the lord uh, that he suffered for you Isaiah chapter 
Isaiah chapter 53, reading there from verse 3. Isaiah chapter 53, reading from verse 3. He was despised. That's what Jesus did for you and rejected of men. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And we did as it were, we hid our faces from him. And he was despised and we esteemed him not. This is the way you should have suffered. Uh, do you see sometimes uh, when they catch a thief? Then they will parade that thief on the street. And then there will be great shame and great sorrow and great suffering. And that's actually what should have happened to every sinner. And that is what will happen on the final day for the sinners who have not come to Christ. The Lord will parade them. Almighty God, he sees on the throne of judgment, the great white throne judgment. He will parade such sinners who did not claim and receive the forgiveness from Christ. He will parade them before the whole world. And then there will be sorrow and grief and shame and reproach and eternal suffering for them. But Jesus Christ has borne that for you. You don't have to bear that even in the life we're living now or in the world to come. He was despised, rejected of men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. We, uh, the Lord even hid his face from him. He was despised, esteemed, and we did esteem him not. Surely, in verse 4, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him, stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded. Why? For our transgression. He was bruised. Why? For our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. You can roll your guilt upon the Lord today. He bore everything for you. You don't have to pay anything anymore. Just come simply to the Lord and say, Lord, I accept what you did for me. You paid that great price for me. He will forgive you. You will be redeemed in verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray and have, uh, we have turned everyone uh, to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord took away your iniquity, all your sin, removed everything from you and laid it on him so that it will not be upon you anymore in verse 7 he was oppressed he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth he wouldn't defend himself he knew why he was bearing it he was bearing it for you he's brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her sharers his dumb so he opened not his mouth was the result of that in verse 11 he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities you are part of the people that the lord died for if you have not been born again today is that wonderful day you can be born again today you will be in jesus name first peter chapter one again first peter chapter one verse 18 for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation i need to explain those words vain conversation in the uh, in the word uh, of the old english conversation there means character it means conduct and when it says vain it means useless worthless character it means that uh, when we were unbelievers we were worthless or we useless our character was so base and hollow and shallow and it didn't have any value at all valueless but now the lord has redeemed us from all those things we praise his holy name we come to point number three the power of his glorious resurrection the power of his glorious resurrection look at verses 20 and 21 it says who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you who by him do believe in god and that raised him from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in god uh, it's a mouthful there you find that the lord is actually telling us a lord and he's still talking about our redemption he's still talking about our salvation our adoption into the family of god the fact that all our sins are forgiven we don't bear the guilt anymore we're redeemed from the curse of the law and we're redeemed from all that sin stands for but it then tells us that that redemption or that salvation did not just come accidentally actually the incarnation of christ that is christ who was god god the son becoming flesh coming into this world that's what is called incarnation the incarnation of christ the death of christ the resurrection of christ they were not as a result of a change of purpose to meet unforeseen circumstances that means that god had known that ahead of time all this 
promises were foreseen and they were foreordained in the eternal purposes of God, eternal counsels of God, eternal mind of God. The sacrifice of Christ was foreordained from all eternity. That's why it says in verse 9, in verse 20, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. That means from the foundation of the world, before the foundation of the world, the death of Christ had been known. It was necessary that he will come and die so that he will take our sins away. Christ was manifested in due time. Christ's manifestation, that is when he was born and when he lived and when he died and when he rose from the dead and even when he ascended up to heaven, all those things were for all sinful men so that our faith and hope might be in God. We are not worthy of this unutterable uh, love of God, this tremendous sacrifice, but he loved us so much and he counted it not so great a price willingly and cheerfully he paid the price let me just show you from scripture that uh, this uh, sacrifice of christ uh, was uh, foreordained even before the foundation of the world in genesis chapter 3 we're looking at verse 15. genesis chapter 3 verse 15. here was uh, what god said at a time when man fell and uh, you will see here that Almighty God himself, he had known about the fall and he had known about what he will do. Chapter 3 of Genesis verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Talking about the seed of the woman. That's talking about Christ that will be born of a virgin that will come to bruise the, hell, the head of the devil in uh, paying the price of our redemption. And in the passage of time, eventually, Jesus Christ came. And when he came, he made the sacrifice, the, uh, the great sacrifice. He paid the great price that he ought to pay for our redemption. In Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth a son made of a woman, I made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. It says when the fullness of time was come. It means the prophecy had been there. The plan had been there. The purpose of God had been from the before the foundation of the world. But then the fullness of time came. The time when Christ should come, that time had arrived. God sent forth his son made of a woman without uh, the uh, help of a man and then it says to redeem them that are under the law that they might receive the adoption of sons that we might become children of god and then it tells us that jesus christ he saved us how did he save us because he lived a perfect life not that's not enough you know in the old testament uh, they will take the lamb the lamb will be without blemish but even though the lamb was without blemish that was not enough they must kill that lamb they, they must slay that lamb and then apply the blood of the lamb it is when i see the blood not when i see the spotless life of the lamb but when i see the blood i will pass over you it's the same thing that the Lord is telling us. It took the death of Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, for us to be forgiven and for all our sins to be taken away. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. Acts 2, 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and for knowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God has raised up having loose from the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. Here we have Christ, the sinless one, the perfect one, the holy one. And yet he died. He died for you and died for me. And then we're told he was raised from the dead in verse 32. This Jesus, the one that lived a perfect life, went to the cross and died for us. As God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses what a wonderful thing that jesus christ came and he died for us how are we to be saved now if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he died for you and that god raised him from the dead the bible says assuredly you will be saved romans chapter 10 romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. 
That means you'll be saved from sin, from the power of sin, from the penalty of sin, from the yoke of sin, from the bondage of sin. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Confession is made unto salvation. We'll say it this way, we'll say confession brings possession. You go to the Lord, number one, you confess your sin. Number two, you confess your inability to save yourself. Number three, you confess the sufficiency of Christ to save you. And then you accept. You say, yes, I believe. He took my sins away. All my sins are taken away. I belong to the Lord now. You say it with your mouth. You confess it with your mouth. That confession of that salvation in Christ will bring possession of that salvation. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Is the grace of God and it is the power of the resurrection of, God, of Christ working in your life. That's why Paul the Apostle said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, he says, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. He understood the price of his redemption. What a redemption is this? Based on God's eternal purpose. And what a hope that goes far beyond time and through all time. And uh, even finds the foundation, the eternal mind of the Almighty God. And then he tells us, come back to First Peter. He tells us the reason why Christ died. And he tells us that everything has been done. The whole thing has been purchased. You have a part now. There is something you have to do. In verse 21, who by him do believe in God? You need to believe. You come out of your sin. You come to the Savior. You come out of darkness. You come into the light. And then you say, I believe that Jesus died, not just that he died for the world, he died for me in particular. When you personalize the death of Jesus Christ and you become a participant, a partaker of the blessing of the redemption, then you claim it for yourself. Who by him do believe that God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory. He raised him from the dead and exalted him and gave him a name above all names that now the mention of the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and he gave him great glory. Now he says so that your faith and hope might be in God. God did all this that we have talked about concerning the sacrifice, the death, the spilling of the blood of Jesus. He did everything that you might believe in him. The resurrection of Christ encourages our faith in God. I encourages our faith in the divine ruler of the whole because he's a gracious forgiving father. He risen Christ also awakens and sustains hope. That's why it says there that your faith, not only your faith and your hope might be in God. His resurrection actually fills us with hope. And he himself said, because I live, ye will live also. I pray that that life of Christ will enter into every one of us. Believing in him, we then will be able to have purifying hope uh, to be where Christ is and to see him as he is and be made like unto him. And very soon the Lord himself will come. And when he comes, if you have that hope in him, you'll be part of the people of God that will match him with the Lord in Jesus name. First John chapter 3 behold verse 1. What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved now are we the sons of God and does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. I pray you will see him. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. If you feel that you are not pure enough to see the Lord when he comes, the blood of Jesus Christ is still flowing fresh from Calvary. You can rise up and you can say, Lord, I am here. Jesus died for me. He gave his blood for me. I will not go to hell. I will not perish because Jesus Christ, he bore my shame. He bore my sorrow. He bore my punishment. He bore everything for me. I can be saved today. I claim my salvation in Christ. I repent of my sin. I believe on the Lord. I am saved. Then you will go through life with faith and hope. Call on the name of the Lord. Call on the name of the Lord. If you have not been saved, he wants to save you. If you have not been born again, he wants you to be born again. All you need to do is just accept. Accept. 
as many as received him to them he gave power to become the sons of god even to them that believe on his name you can believe today and then go through life as a stranger as a sojourner as a pilgrim then you have hope you have faith you have love and then you know with the consciousness assurance you are redeemed by the blood of the lamb don't go until you have that assurance very very simple receive him and he is yours